So I um, just wanted to say how privileged I, I feel to be invited to um, speak with the great lineup that we've got today and a number of my uh, personal heroes uh, have been speaking today. Um, I'm going to talk about carbohydrate restriction in diabetes management. Um, and this is the, the presentation that I gave at the ADA meeting uh, where I participated in a debate on low carb. So firstly, I need to explain why a radiologist is speaking about diabetes and I'm going to discuss an N equals 1 crossover trial which I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in October 2012 and I was given standard dietary advice which I followed uh, very rigorously for two months. And then I switched to a low carb, high fat diet, ketogenic diet and I followed that for 20 months. So this is the standard advice that I was given, the food pyramid, 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate at each meal. Uh, some snacks, total carbohydrates of 240 grams, and I was told to adjust my bolus insulin to match my carbohydrate dose. Uh, this is in line with the Diabetes Australia recommendations, which say that to manage your diabetes, uh, you need to spread out your meals throughout the day, that they should be lower in fat, particularly saturated fat, and that they should be based on high fibre carbohydrate foods. And I did that. And this was the result. This is a trace of my blood sugars. This is considered excellent control, by the way. My ins <laughs> uh, insulin dose was 24 units. Daily, I would go over 7.5. Uh, I would have a hypo about once a week. And my estimated HbA burn C based on this would be about 7. 7% 7. Uh, 7 of type 1 UK diabetics get under 7, so this is considered excellent control. During this time, I did a lot of reading. And, um, and I read Stephen Finney's work. I read. Uh, papers by Francisca, so two of my real heroes are speaking today. And I switched to a diet that looks like this, a diet that's composed of nutritionally dense whole foods, and good healthcare starts with real food. And this is what it looks like. It's not, a, uh, it's not based on meat, it's a lot of vegetables. Vegetables fill a half to two thirds of my plate. I cut out these foods because they contain too much carbohydrates and I no longer have the ability to process them. I know people will find the fruit bit controversial, but I eat lots of vegetables and I do eat berries. And this was the results. This is my blood glucose when I was preparing this talk. This is, I'm predominantly in normal non-diabetic range. My insulin dose is now 10 units. I rarely go above 7.5. I rarely hypo and I cycle 40, 50 Ks without any carbohydrates. And that's because I now burn fat as a fuel. So if we were to compare November 2012 versus November 2013, this is what it looks like. On the recommended diet and on the very low carbohydrate diet. And the comment I would make that observational studies are no substitute for a patient with a glucometer. <laughs> I've now been on, uh, following a low carbohydrate, high fat diet for 20 months. Uh, my hba and c is normal range at 5.2. I rarely spike above 7.5. My triglycerides are down, my HDL is up, my weight is slow and stable, um, my blood pressure is good, waist circumference is good, I surf, I cycle. Uh, this is a sustainable diet and I suffer no hunger. Now, I don't want to just talk about me, I want to talk about, um, I'm going to give some other examples, it's not just me, and then I'm going to give some science to back it up. This is Keith Runyon, who's an American. He followed, he's had a type 1 for 16 years. Uh, he posted this to, under my radio interview. I was interviewed on the ABC. He said, the immediate effect was cessation of hypoglycemia. I can't describe how wonderful that is, and I would back that up. I can't tell you what it's like to go hypo, and I have a very responsible job, and this sudden, to suddenly feel like you, you know, you've got to grab some sugar is horrible, and, uh, and I don't hypo anymore. I very rarely hypo. I'm going to give a couple of other examples. Oh, he's just finished an Ironman triathlon. Uh, this is a Paul Buchanan. I've made contact with him in the UK. He set up a charity called Team Blood Glucose, which encourages exercise in di diabetics. He's a very similar story to mine. He's a software engineer. A1C on diagnosis 13.4, had it down to 5.1% within four months. Remember I said 7% of the UK diabetics get under 7%. He participates in triathlons, Ironman events, multi-day cycling. And they're currently cycling between where the European Congress was held last year and where it's held next year. I think it's approximately 3,000 kilometres of cycling. And uh, half of his team's on a low-carb, high-fat diet. Uh, this is another uh, guy who's uh, into uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and he saw my interview on the ABC. 
He said uh, he used to inject 16 units of Lantus um, and some rapid acting, six to seven for each meal. Decent control, but lots of hypos. Now he's just on Lantus, no rapid acting. When he used to train, his blood sugars would be unstable, had lots of hypos. Now all his energy is from fat. He can train for two hours without any fear. He hasn't had a hypo in three months. So this is not just me, there are lots of stories. Daniel Jones is a radiologist. You find lots of people on the net. Type 1, he said, I wish I'd been told that low carb was an option 20 years ago. Years of, he said, my endocrinologists were my friends and I had access to the best. Years of spikes greater than 10 could have easily been avoided and the potential complications with them senseless now in retrospect. Patients and doctors need to realise that there is a low carb option. I'm going to show now some of the slides that I went through um, for the debate and I'll also show the opposing arguments side. So while our team argued science, you'll see what was put up by the other team. So the aims of, of diabetes treatment are to normalise blood sugar and to minimise hypoglycemia. And blood sugar, it's not just the HbA1c, it's also the variability. So the spikes of glucose do damage. If we look at the, uh, why the HbA1c is so important, for every 1% reduction in HbA1c, there's a 14% reduction in myocardial infarcts. And for every 1% reduction in HbA1c, the microvascular endpoints, such as uh, kidney failure, um, peripheral ischemia, those uh, sorts of diabetic retinopathy, are reduced by a mass of 37%, so it is critical. There are some important secondary aims of diabetes management. So we want to correct the atherogenic dyslipidemia that we've heard about. We want to reduce inflammation, reduce blood pressure. We want to encourage exercise. 50% of type 1 diabetics are too scared to exercise because of hypos, and that's because of the diet that they're on, they are burning glucose as a fuel. If you can get them to switch to burning fat as a fuel, they, they'll be able to exercise without this fear. We want to reduce weight and waist circumference and minimise medications. So let's look at some studies. This was a study done in Sweden. It's a small study on type 1s. All they did was give five educational sessions on a low-carb, high-fat diet. Um, they restricted the carbs to under 75 grams a day and they followed the outcomes. And this is what they saw in blood glucose. You'll remember the traces that I showed you. This is what they saw. They saw traces that were identical to mine. That's from Grant Schofield. Thank you, Grant, for that uh, slide. And this is over time. You see the, the good adherence and the partial adherence dropped their HbA1c dramatically. And the, the, the guys that couldn't, they, just, they drifted back to, to where they were pre. And so in summary, in the, in, in the trial, the adherent and partially adherent group, they reduced their HbA1c's by 1.3%. This is the group that I'm interested in. Clearly, I'm an adherent. Mealtime insulin, they dropped from 23 to 13. There was a massive reduction in symptomatic hypoglycemia by 82%. This was critical for me. I hated the hypos. HDL increased and the total cholesterol to HDL ratio improved. So all good results. I'm going to show you, this was recently published out of our own CSIRO in, in Adelaide, a very low carbohydrate, low saturated diet for type 2 diabetes, randomised trial. Took a group of obese adults with type 2, randomised them to a hypocaloric low carb diet or an energy matched high carb diet. This is in a high impact journal. It was with structured exercise over 24 weeks and they measured HbA1c, glycemic variability, the use of medication, blood lipids and um, BP. Completion rates were similar, weight loss was similar, fasting blood glucose was similar, LDL cholesterol was similar. But low carb one on HbA1c, on glucose variability, uh, they were able to reduce their medications despite also improvements in glucose and HbA1c. The triglycerides went down and the HDL went up. So that's a fantastic result. A previous study done comparing a low calorie versus a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet in type two diabetes. In this trial, they had 102 with type 2, 24 went on low calorie, 78 went on a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. The uh, ketogenic diet beat the low calorie diet in gl glucose and HbA1c, but it also beat it for body weight, BMI, waist circumference, triglycerides, HDL, so everything got better. These are randomised controlled trials. Now in the debate that I just participated in, I was expecting, you know, most medical debates, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but I'd call them sort of uh, scientific papers at 10 paces. And uh, typically what happens is I say, I've got these scientific papers, and they say, oh, that's rubbish, I've got these scientific papers. 
But we didn't get that. I'll show what we got shortly. In summary, low-carb, high-fat diet reduces and stabilises blood glucose. It reduces hypoglycemia. HDL improves. Triglycerides reduce. Visceral fat reduces. Weight reduces. The small, dense particles reduce and the blood pressure reduces. There's a number of myths that are brought up about low-carb, high-fat diets. I'll talk about the kidney function. It's complete rubbish. In fact, if you reduce the blood pressure in the HbA1c and the glycemic variability, that will assist in preserving function. A lot of people say, oh, there's a reduction in fibre. In fact, if you look at people on a low-carb, high-fat diet, what it usually involves is a shift from flour and potatoes to green vegetables, and that's the shift that I've had. So I eat more green leafy vegetables. In fact, I would eat more vegetables than a vegetarian because I don't eat grains. If you look at uh, recent meta-analyses and a Cochrane review, these are considered the highest, some of the highest standards of medical evidence, and they've shown no significant association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease, and research supports the safety of a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And so in, in summary, the benefits of carbohydrate restriction for diabetes management are immediate and documented, and any concerns about the risk are conjectural and long-term. So this was my presentation to the debate. I'll now put up the uh, opposition views. We were told that it was an extreme diet. We were told that it was a seductive diet, but that it was impossible to follow. We were told that because we were non-nutritionists, we had no right to comment, because we had no training in nutrition. And yet, I might not have any training in nutrition, but I had excellent training in biochemistry and physiology, and I know how to read a paper. That we were told that if the world were to adopt this diet, we would all starve. So we were not only were we were we uh, extremists, but we were going to starve. We were going to cause world starvation. Um, we were told that sugar and carbs are not the cause of diabetes and obesity, despite that being clearly wrong. We were told that if people were to adopt our message, that children would miss out on the nutritional value of chocolate milk. <laughs> And we were told that we were just in it to sell books and to make money. Um, this is my motivation. And uh, what does that mean? Well, I've got three young boys and I read children's books to them a lot. And probably the best book I've ever read is one by Dr. Seuss. And he said this, unless, and this is from the Lorax, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. And in fact, I think all of the speakers, that's, what we've come across, that's why we have chosen this path, because we realise that unless we spoke out, nothing is going to change. Thank you.